This video is supported by Squarespace, the all-in-one platform for your online presence. Hey hey, Marcus House with you here. As always, there is space news everywhere to talk about this week. At Starbase, the next generation of Starship is being assembled, while Booster 4 testing finally involves the use of methane. Another captivating spacewalk with breathtaking views of the International Space Station and our world below. OneWeb changes launch provider, and with the deployment of the James Webb Space Telescope happening just as we hit a tally of 5,000 recorded exoplanets and counting, are we about to enter a new golden era for astronomy? Okay, Neil, we can see you coming down the ladder now. Well, I think it is safe to say that the past two weeks have had elevated activity at SpaceX's Starbase in Boca Chica, where the site at Florida seemed to have been a hive of activity instead for a few weeks prior to that, a higher gear seems to be selected here in Brownsville. We have some announcements that took a lot by surprise, which I'll jump into shortly, but first let's catch up on the earlier events since the last weekly video. We left off with the fully stacked Starship 20 and Booster 4 towering into the sky being cryo-tested. It stayed up there for several days. Last Saturday, the ship quick disconnect plate was retracted away from Ship 20, and the arm itself was soon rotated away from the vehicle, which allows for the Mechazilla system to transverse down the tower. Beautiful footage of this as always by NASA Spaceflight. The transport stand was moved next to the orbital launch mount, all ready to receive the ship. Just after 7pm that night, the stabilisation arms engaged, and soon after, stage separation was confirmed, with Ship 20 being destacked from Booster 4, where it was soon lowered down onto the stand. Interestingly, this appears to be the first time that SpaceX had not closed the roads to destack. That, I think, is just a neat observation. So, Ship 20 was then later rolled over to the ship testing and cryo station area. Now on Monday, Highway 4 was closed to the public in the morning ahead of the test enclosure, which was expected to be a fueling test of Booster 4, more specifically liquid methane and liquid nitrogen together. Additionally, a pad closure announcement was heard at the launch site stating to all personnel at the pad that a pad closure would occur in one hour and to please leave the pad now. 3pm was soon upon us and the tank farm was active and venting from what appeared to be near the methane storage tanks. The methane recondenser was venting as well, which only happens, of course, when the methane is involved. This test continued into the evening. Now, as far as I recall, this is the first time that we've had methane going into the booster itself. The main question is why only liquid methane and not liquid oxygen as well. I can only assume that this test was more to purge the methane lines and to test out the fuel farm systems rather to test the booster itself. Highly speculative, but I'm interested in your thoughts there. What do you think SpaceX were up to here with this test? By midnight, the tests were concluded, the road was reopened, and all of that was completed. At this point, it looked like Booster 4's tests were about done, with SpaceX's LR11000 crane lifting up the massive load spreader on Tuesday to be later attached to Booster 4, and then on Wednesday, the booster quick disconnect retracted away from it, all ahead of its dismount from orbital pad A. This occurred on Thursday afternoon when the clamps on the orbital launch mount released, leaving Booster 4 to gently swing in the air and the lift was soon underway. Over an hour later, Booster 4 touched down onto the transport stand. Now, this is where we get to our surprising announcement, of course. This quite unfortunate yet kind of expected news was confirmed by Elon Musk this week on Twitter. He confirmed that the first orbital flight will be with Raptor 2s as they are much more capable and reliable with 230 tonnes of thrust at sea level. Now, obviously, Ship 20 and Booster 4 has all of the Raptor 1s installed, so there will be no flight to orbit for this collision. Colossal Beast, which was rolled to the launch site for the first time back in August of last year. These behemoths have been sitting around now for over 230 days. Can you believe how fast that time has gone? Okay, so many of you might be thinking that, oh man, this is sucky, and that is where the sucky news does end though, because in the same tweet, he also stated that they will have 39 flight-worthy Raptor 2 engines 
built by April, with another month needed to integrate those with the vehicle. Therefore, we now hope to see the orbital flight test in May, assuming that approvals are given between then. The FAA have pushed another month again, of course, as seen on Friday, so let's just hope that by the time that the next full stack is ready, we also see this resolved. The constant monthly pushbacks are, I agree, feeling quite frustrating at this point. I think if they had simply provided a more realistic time from the start, people wouldn't get so riled up about it. So which booster and which ship could be making this flight? Could Elon Musk be referring to Booster 7 and Ship 24? We all certainly hope so. Over to news at the build site, construction continues on the new ships and boosters. Booster 9's common dome sleeve was rolled outside one of the tents and flipped upright. It is still, however, unknown if this is being reassigned to Booster 8, given that its common dome section was scrapped a few weeks back. In the high bay, Booster 7 received its triangular aero covers, which can now also technically be called chines or strakes, over one row of COPVs. It has been rolling in and out of the high bay as well, preparing it seems for a move very soon. The forward sleeve for Booster 9 has been flipped upright and its forward dome was rolled out of a tent and lifted onto the sleeving stand to then be sleeved on Tuesday. This booster liquid oxygen header tank that was seen in the build yard has since been rolled into a tent and then integrated with the after dome section that is believed to be for Booster 8. We also have a middle liquid oxygen section with thermal protection system studs, likely for Ship 25, was lifted out of Tent 3 and then rolled into the nose yard. Okay, so it has been a little while now since we've seen a new test tank. The first section of a test tank of Booster 7.1 has been found outside of the high bay, which is made up of four 1.5 meter rings, similar to the previous booster after dome that was sleeved recently. This, we suspect, is going to be a 33 engine test tank. And speaking of the 33 engines, a fourth 13 engine thrust puck for the inner set of engines on a booster was delivered this week as well. So yes, a new test tank, but what does all of this mean? Yep, we need to reintroduce this booster test stand dubbed the Can Crusher. Sure enough, out of the build site it rolled and off to the launch site this week. There it sits now parked at the Booster Cryo Station area. Now, some exciting HLS news this week. NASA has selected Starship for an additional mission to the moon with astronauts as part of the Artemis program. At least, I think that is what it says. See what you think. It says here, exercising an option under the original award, NASA now is asking SpaceX to transform the company's proposed human landing system into a spacecraft that meets the agency's requirements for recurring services for a second demonstration <laughs> mission. It's not beautifully clear, is it? Artemis 3 was already a Awarded, of course, and will have astronauts touching down on the moon aboard a SpaceX Starship human landing system. I assume there will be multiple now under a new award being finalised. Speaking of HLS, a neat clip here by Ryan Bale just chatting away to Victor Glover just recently. As Victor stated here, his main role right now is as the HLS representative. I'm very happy with the team that SpaceX has put together. I'm very happy with the team NASA has put together, and, and I think we're working together well. Uh, to, to accomplish this really challenging, really complicated mission. So far, the work is going very well, but there is a lot more to be done yet. I really do hope that we get to hear and see a lot more around this. So yes, NASA, please do help us share this incredible news. Now, I talked about a potential Starship payload dispenser installed into Ship 24 last week, along with the door cutout on the nose cone barrel. I had a number of people in the comments suggesting that this is just as likely a test elevator system for HLS. Now, I don't believe so. Firstly, this door is much too small for that. And secondly, the priority is to get as many of those Starlink version 2 satellites into orbit as quickly as possible. Starship is not going to be doing missions with lives on board anytime soon, and until it is at least well tested out and proven with many uncrewed missions. This week, Eric X and Small Stars released a stunning animation on Twitter of how this dispenser could work, almost like a gigantic Pez dispenser sending out one satellite at a time. Totally speculative, but it looks very cool all the same. If this was the case, there would be no need to open up this massive payload bay either. Give them a follow there on Twitter and YouTube. Thanks for supporting them. They do such great work. And hey, check this out as well. Yep, you guys did it. 400,000 of you subscribers. Thank you so much for all of your support over these crazy few years. It sure has been 
such a wild ride. It's all because of you though. I could put all of the work in the world into these Saturday videos, but if there was no one to care or watch it, it just would be all for nothing, wouldn't it? So I'm massively grateful to each and every one of you. One little note for this coming week, we have a surprise video coming. If you love 3D printed rockets, you are really going to enjoy this one. Okay, so as speculated in last Saturday's episode, SpaceX has indeed stepped in to help British company OneWeb stay on track with their launch plans. I'll jump into that in a moment, but just quickly, a huge thank you to Squarespace today for their support of this video. Squarespace is an incredible all-in-one platform to build your online presence to promote yourself, your business, or your brand. Even if you've got little experience in creating your own online content, you will immediately feel right at home creating a website with Squarespace. There's no better way to start than just taking a dive in. Simply choose one of the amazing templates and begin entering your content. If you have a following of your own already, or even if you plan to build one, you can create revenue streams with your content utilizing the monetization controls within member areas. You can even provide the option to choose a reoccurring fee schedule if you are offering a frequent service. You can add to this as well. Commenting is a great way to promote interaction with your visitors and create an engaged community around your site. This is all inbuilt into Squarespace as well. The comments are sorted as unmoderated, approved or flagged so that you have the control that you need. Just one neat little feature that you may not even realize is available. If you want to check it out for yourself, just head to squarespace.com slash Marcus House and save 10% off the first purchase of a website or domain. You'll find that link in the description below. So yes, SpaceX has stepped in to help OneWeb continue launching their satellites into orbit. As we see here in an announcement from OneWeb earlier this week, they can once again proceed with their satellite launches thanks to this new deal. Partially owned by the British government, OneWeb was saved from bankruptcy in 2020 and has deployed around 66% or some 428 satellites for its planned constellation. With the six Soyuz launches that were planned, OneWeb were expecting to attain their global coverage goals by by August. Unfortunately, the recent events in Europe turned these plans upside down, leaving OneWeb satellites with no ability to reach orbit. Earlier this month, we saw the scheduled launch from Baikonur Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan completely cancelled. The 36 OneWeb satellites sitting atop the Soyuz launch vehicle never lifted off after OneWeb declined to agree to the conditions placed upon them by Roscosmos. Now, thanks to the support from SpaceX, this launch limbo is not going to last long. While it may seem like an odd pairing of competitors here, SpaceX and OneWeb have different target customers. It's great to see that it is possible to partner with a launch provider who also has a considerable investment in space-based internet for consumers. Their common goals are mutually beneficial, of course, and the first launch is expected in the not too distant future. The details of the agreement reached here are confidential, so it's not currently clear how many launches will be required, how many satellites, or which launch vehicle configuration. However, it is thought that it will be the ever-reliable Falcon 9. In the light of all this launch provider restructure, we now see the European Space Agency also having to review its plans, not least of which was the recent suspension of the two-part ExoMars mission. Launching the Trace Gas Orbiter in 2016, the second part to this program was to see the launch of a Mars rover named Rosalind Franklin after this year, but sadly the collaboration between ESA and Roscosmos had to be suspended. NASA was also participating in this mission, providing a mass spectrometer for the rover as well as other technical assistance. So yes, there are huge issues now around completing this Mars program, given that the rover was meant to be delivered to the Martian surface by a Russian lander, which would have served as a surface platform for conducting science experiments. It's now thought to be basically impossible for a launch to take place this year. Hopefully one day in the future, this mission can be completed. Now, last week I talked about the James Webb Space Telescope progress with the mirror alignment going beautifully, and now also obtaining incredible images already without even using the main near-infrared camera yet to be tested. Check out last week's video if you need a quick update on that. More information did follow though, with it being announced soon after that the image seen here is as sharp and as crisp as the images that the Hubble Space Telescope can take, but are also at the same time at a wavelength of light that is totally invisible to Hubble. So yes, this is making the invisible universe snap into very, very sharp focus. And this leads me into one of my favorite topics actually. 
This week, NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory published this article announcing a massive cosmic research milestone with a confirmed 5,000 exoplanets now being found in total. But what I thought was more interesting was the incredible acceleration in planets found up to this year. Attached to the article is this animation. I've got a link in the description for this for you so that you can check it out. It is super high resolution and the animation and audio included shows humanity's discovery of each planet beyond our solar system over time. As we've found each exoplanet, a circle pops up and the size of each signifies the relative size of the planet's orbit. Notice as well that there are four colors which indicates the type of planet detection method used. I just think this is really beautiful and if you listen to the audio, the pitch of each note indicates the orbit period of the planet. Lower pitches are further out from the star and then higher pitches are closer. What is particularly wonderful to me were these huge bursts of transit detections that all go off at once in 2014 and 2016. So the reason that they all pop in at once like this is because you need to set up a telescope to stare for years at a field of stars, apparently over 170,000 at a time in this case, and they then track the tiny dips in starlight when a planet crosses a star's face. After picking up all that data, all of these were known simultaneously using that transit method. You can see here compared to the other methods just how successful that has been. The Kepler telescope has picked up thousands of these alone. In total here, you can see the percentages as a breakdown. As technology has advanced, we are able to track smaller and smaller planets. Only 4% of these found so far are around the size of Earth here, and over 30% are super Earths. This is just so cool to see. And then keep in mind that we've only looked at a minuscule slice of what is out there. This sort of data is why I'm just so excited about telescopes. Imagine the equally incredible data that will be discovered by the James Webb Space Telescope. We live in just the most exciting time of history, and I'm just so grateful for that. It's such a humbling experience just watching this play out. NASA astronaut Raja Shari and Matthias Maurer from the European Space Agency conducted a spacewalk on March the 23rd. Taking almost seven hours to complete various maintenance tasks on the International Space Station, Raja, with the red stripe on his suit, was on his second EVA, while this was the first for Matthias. On egress from the Quest airlock, there was a delay of around an hour after buddy checks revealed a loose camera and light assembly on a helmet. Now we've seen this before on a previous walk. A quick fix using a wire tire, and they were both on their way to complete their primary objective. Raja set off to replace a pair of flex hoses on one of the port side radiators that bleed off heat generated by the station's electronics, while Matthias ran some power and data cables for a camera to be replaced later in the spacewalk. Other activities included installation of a jumper on a Columbus module and releasing some clamps on the Bartolomeo science platform, the exterior mount used for scientific experiments. Once safely back inside, the crew moved quickly to extract Matthias from his suit due to water in his helmet, leaving Raja to wait patiently in the background. Overall, it was a very precise ballet of movements outside, achieving all objectives, closing out the 248th spacewalk in support of the orbital outpost. Speaking of the ISS, NASA has ordered 12 additional cargo flights to the station, awarding six of them to SpaceX and six to Northrop Grumman. That will provide resupply services to the ISS now right through to 2026. Some other very quick mentions as well. It was revealed early this week that SpaceX are discontinuing their partnership with Spaceflight Industries after the existing manifest has been completed, a move which apparently surprised Spaceflight with them saying that they were still unsure of the reasoning behind it. Apparently they were actually notified by text. So yeah, it's a little bit odd. I know SpaceX has refused to launch a Sherpa LTC space vehicle on SpaceX's Transporter 3 mission. That I believed had some sort of propulsion leak or or something, so I'm not sure if that sort of mishap has anything to do with this decision. But in the future, SpaceX sound like they will be managing more rideshare customers directly. Presumably that will also increase the costs for these small sats, so perhaps smaller payloads will end up dealing with others like Rocket Lab in the future. 
The Mars helicopter Ingenuity took a flight for the 22nd time, hovering around the thin Martian atmosphere for 101.4 seconds. Considering the initial plan was to attempt no more than five flights, this program so far has been hugely successful. I kind of wish we got to see a little more publicity and animations around Ingenuity. It's just been so great watching this news because a year ago we didn't even know if powered controlled flight like this was even possible. It has lasted already well beyond what anyone expected, and NASA has actually extended this mission now through to at least September. That is pretty incredible, and the Ingenuity Mars helicopter team members were awarded the Goddard Memorial Trophy on March the 18th. I'm also looking forward to checking out the new documentary being released in early April that will be showing some new inside access to NASA and SpaceX. Netflix shared this trailer recently, which will dive into the thrilling story of the Demo 2 mission with Doug Hurley and Bob Behnken in June of 2020. It's weird that this wasn't produced and published well before this, or at least before Inspiration 4's Countdown documentary last year. But all the same, I just can't wait to see this. This was a real nerve-wracking mission, sending humans to space for the first time time since the shuttle retired in 2011, the first private company ever to do it as well. Certainly one of the most critical achievements in SpaceX's 20 years of existence. So yes, you are all caught up on yet another week of space goodness. Lots more coming in next Saturday's video, so stay tuned there. And thanks so much to all of you amazing people out there that love space and space technology. As I tweeted out here as we crossed that 400,000 subscriber mark, without you, there is no way that I can create this content that we do here. It's such a blur as well, with all of this happening in a few short years. How do I even convey how grateful I am to each and every one of you? I don't even know. Thanks for all of your support, your time, your enthusiasm, everything, every share, every like, comment, it all helps more than anyone realises. And thanks mostly, I think, for spreading your love of this topic to everyone else around you. I think as soon as that we can pass that love on, it really helps people appreciate what is out there and what amazing humans can do. If you love the content, like my incredible patrons and YouTube members, every little bit helps, and you can get those ad-free videos delivered before anyone else gets to see them. The merch store links are below as well if you want some new gear like like this, that's a great way to support as well. The tile in the bottom left today will take you back to the video from last week. If you missed that one, we had the Starship cryo tests, Astro Launch, and James Webb Space Telescope updates. In the top right is the latest video, and the bottom right, content that YouTube thinks that you will like from the channel. Thanks as always for watching all this way through, and I'll see you all in the next video.